Um, so hope everyone is comfortable having um, either a delicious dinner or happy hour uh, wherever you are in, in New York or around around the state there. Um, like Joshua said, we'll, we're giving you the new enhanced perfected version of, of this shortly here. Um, so I'll bring up the deck in, in just a minute. And, you know, when I mentioned this kind of keys to running a successful fundraising strategy, um, you know, we see a lot of content and um, folks talking about how do you actually win over an investor and what are the things I need to focus on my business to make it an investable business? Um, you know, tons of topic and conversation around this, right? Hitting new metrics. And so, you know, Nick and I want to set the stage a little bit with some fundraising isms we'll go into uh, before we get there. But then also, you know, about halfway through or so, really dive into a tactical planning and preparing. How do I actually target and profile the right investors? How do I track that process? How do I develop a pipeline? And uh, so on and so forth. So hopefully, if you don't have a process already, um, this will give you somewhere to start. And if you do, and you've been doing this for, for a little while, maybe there's some tidbits in here that you can add, uh, make things a lot more efficient and effective as, as you go on this journey. Um, so with that, mention I'm JD. I, um, I help lead our Oracle for Startups program um, here in the States, really helping startups um, scale into the enterprise. So landing large enterprise customers through integrations, through marketing, co-sell, so on and so forth. And then also acting as the intersection, we have lots of venture capital partners. Um, so folks look, look to us um, for both funding and then also, uh, so connections to VCs. And then on the other side of things, VCs putting companies into our program um, to either sell to Oracle or do other interesting things with, with our sales force. Um, so with that, Nick, you wanna quickly introduce yourself and I'll bring up this uh, Prezo. Yeah, sure, sure thing, JD. And Hope everyone's doing all right out there and appreciate you joining us. Um, my name is Nick Spiller. I'm a fundraising coach based down here in Austin. I've uh, known JD for, for over a decade and been, been working on startups down here the whole time. I uh, helped start a few entrepreneurship organizations at the University of Texas. Uh, the last four years up until the end of 2020, I led investor relations for, for Capital Factory. You know, over that time, I've helped over 100 entrepreneurs raise money for their startups. I've raised a few venture funds uh, when I was at Capital Factory. And, and today, I partner with entrepreneurs to help increase the odds their funding rounds are successful. So uh, in a lot of ways, you might hire a, a web development firm or a marketing agency. You can hire funding camps, and uh, we bring our process and expertise to your to your fundraise. And so, uh, yeah, excited to be here to talk about it for funding month and uh, be part of Startup Grind New York. All right. And Nick, I'll just get a gut check from you because I'm new-ish to the to the Bevy platform. Um, is that showing okay, our screen and, and deck? Yep, looks looks good to me. Okay, cool. Um, Y'all can yell, us, yell at us in the chat uh, if it doesn't or if something goes wrong there. Um, but then also, just to engage as well, it'd be super helpful. So, um, you know, setting the stage before we dive into this, uh, be helpful if y'all can really utilize the chat and explore, you know, just to get a better sense for Nick and I as we dive a little bit deeper here, um, throw in a one, two, three, or four, depending on what stage of fundraising you're in. And so, you know, one, looking at, which I suspect kind of most of this will gear towards the one and two, but called a pre-seed or angel funding. So really the first check or the first money that you're looking to, to fundraise for your business around, you know, call it under a, a half a million dollars. Um, number two is around that seed stage. So a lot of times the first institutional capital, uh, maybe up to $2 million, maybe a first priced term sheet might be looking at there um, in, instead of a convertible note. Number three, you know, series A, two to 10 million. And then of course, kind of 10 million, we call series B and growth. Don't pay attention to those being super uh, exacting to, to the levels, but this gives us a good gauge anyway. Um, so we'll live in mostly that one to two uh, area, but you know some of the stuff will definitely be helpful throughout you know your fundraising journey where, wherever you are. Um, great. So you know diving right in here, 
like we said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some new, per, you know, different perspectives for you all to think of the venture capital landscape. Um, and so, you know, fundraising isms that Nick and I like to share and, um, you know, some interesting metaphors that I think will help put things in perspective before we really talk about, okay, how do I just get the right investors in the door and, and recruit money? Um, so number one, off the bat, you know, understanding behind the scenes what VC really is, right? Venture investors are in the business of selling money. And they sell it for a rather expensive price, right? They're literally selling the same dollars that you can get from any other investor um, for a portion of, of your company, right? And equity in your company. And so you are the ones that really differentiate, uh, you know, amongst one another, having a really valuable, interesting uh, company. And so understand this, that, you know, without entrepreneurs, and without you building really rock star businesses and, and being superheroes of the craft, their their uh, industry does not exist. And so um, understand that you are you're in the, the power position here. Um, the next thing, kind of right down the line, is uh, a great metaphor I, I like to preach when we talk about these things, which is investors invest in lines, not dots. And what that means is, you know. Very rarely, um, and, and I hope this is the case for some of you when it happens, do you show up to, um, to an investor meeting and say, hey, you know, Joshua, hey, nice to meet you, raising, you know, a million dollars, we needed X, Y, and Z, and Joshua goes, great, let me wire you the check, what's your banking information, this was a great meeting, I, you know, I enjoyed it. Um, usually it's going to take a little bit more effort and a lot more time than that, a lot more meetings and so on. So um, each time you're going to meet an investor is going to be a dot in that process. And really great investors are not investing in that first dot that they meet you on, but they're investing in the lines that connect these data points, which is over time, how do you communicate with them? How does your growth look? What's your execution um, going to be like? You know, coming out of tough times, are you transparent with that and really growing um, in, in saving the business and communicating that in a fair manner? So all these kinds of connections of the dots are, are really what, what investors look, look, look for. Um, the third one here we've got is, you know, every uh, tall skyscraper needs, you know, needs a strong foundation. And so, you know, in, in, in your city there, I'm, I'm, we're dialing in here both from Texas um, if you look around the skyline, any large, large building you see, if it goes up and, uh, and the foundation's a little bit crooked and wonky and, you know, shoots over to the right, um, typically you can't build the building that high, right? It's going to lean, crash and burn pretty early on before you get into a you know, later stage of, of building, building the, the building or building your company. And so it's a great metaphor to understand that your earliest investors are your most important champions and very, very important partners in this process. Um, you know, it's kind of, you, you hear a lot of the cringeworthy, uh, let's say metaphors around dating, which is absolutely true. This can be, you know, a 10 year or plus relationship with investor. So make sure you're just choosing those, those early folks wisely. Um, you know, and the number one advice for this, which, you know, in all different ways, shapes and forms, forms it comes down to is really um, asking, ask these investors, hey, can I meet companies or go find the companies that they've already invested in and talk to those entrepreneurs and ask what they're like, right? Ones that are doing really well and ones that are doing not so great. Um, that's really important for, for your diligence process. So Nick, I'll let you jump in uh, if you've got anything on that or, or maybe just to kick off the, the next couple of of isms we've got. Sure. Uh, well, you know, I think when it, when it comes to picking your, your early investors, it's, it's it, you need time, right? And I think what what ends up becoming such an issue is just entrepreneurs get themselves in a position where they need the capital fast, really too fast. And so I just, I would recommend figuring out when you're in this early uncertain fundraising period, you know, for everyone that put a one or a two at that stage, you know, like you, you want to give yourself as much flexibility as, as possible and just understanding that, you know, things take, take long and, and really at the same time, you can accelerate that timeline just as easily when you do get the capital. Right. But um, yeah. And then, and, and then 
that's when you can really sit back and, and, and pick your investors because you don't have that that you know desperation to get the money you know before it's natural. Um, and then you know the next one about ask for money, get advice, ask for advice, get money. That's you know, one of the oldest sayings in the book. Uh, I think it really gets at you know, building a relationship with the investor. And you know if you're asking for money, it's very transactional. Uh, you know, and, angel investors, VCs, it's not a transactional business. It's not like, you know, just placing a trade on Robinhood or buying something from the store. Like, you know, you expect to, you know, really get to know these people and, and, and build trust. And I've seen a lot of research actually that investors value trust and, and the CEO over anything to do with the business, even, you know, fast growth and, and stuff like that. It's really, you know, do they trust the the CEO to steward the capital and, and to make the right decisions regardless of the the, the situation, right? Because at the end of the day, really, you should have the business lined up at the beginning. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's really just a matter of how well is the CEO going to operate and respond to these things in the market. And yeah, it all starts with just you know, asking for advice, involving them in your, your business, you know, intellectually, getting them, you know, engaged, challenged, Maybe actually have them you know, take some ownership for some some parts of it, uh, and then they'll you know, then they're going to want to invest. They won't be able to, to pass up the opportunity to invest. And again, that takes time, and you need to you know, put yourself in a position to to do that over time, and not have to to rush it faster than, than it is. Um, don't get caught up in all the glitz, glamour, and, and headlines. Uh, you know, it's. It, venture deals get a disproportionate amount of, of attention, right? And, and so you can, you know, there's you know, 5,000 companies that are funded by early stage VCs at any given time. You know, at the same time, there's 30 million small businesses in the country, but it's just, you know, it's the one or two that get funding that are gonna get in, in the news and, you know, blow up online and, and have all the money. And so, you know, if it feels like everyone's getting all this money and like, why aren't you like, well, well actually like, no, a very small percentage of people are getting money. Um, and, and, but just like everyone kind of sees it when it, when it happens. So, um, you know, don't get caught up in all that. I think, again, you kind of, kind of, you got to detach yourself from this financing timeline, especially before you have a, an investment partner. It's a little different once you take an investor, cause they're going to expect you to you know, grow fast and, burn cash and, and raise more money and they're going to be there. You're kind of on the treadmill with them. But before you get that investment partner, you don't want to, you don't want to get ahead of your skis. So you're, you're overextended and, and end up, uh, yeah, like just not being able to, to, uh, get the round done. Um, cause you're basically like you, companies will act like they're venture funded and grow like they're venture funded before they're they're They have the actual funding. And that's a recipe for, for disaster. <laughs> Huge recipe for disaster. Yeah, I think we both highly recommend checking out the WeWork documentary that's come out, right? And so a lot of these folks you see will just throw money at the problem. But to reiterate what Nick was, was saying before is that, you know, it's true that more venture dollars are, are going into uh, the world and our ecosystem than ever before, right? And so there are, I think, um, you know, the stat is more venture dollars, you know, in just this quarter than all of last year of 2020. And, um, you know, but most of those dollars, majority of it are going actually into much fewer companies at, at the growth stage. And so, you know, make, make no doubt about it, like this is still a very, very difficult um, process. It's very hard to get funded, as many of you know. Um, if you sold three companies for, for $300 million and were an early PM at Uber and, you know, went to Stanford and Harvard, it might look a little bit different in that profile. But for the vast majority of businesses getting kicked up and started, um, it's certainly super difficult. So just don't get caught up in what your competitors are doing, what you see in the headlines. Stick to the fundamentals of your business and, um, and you're, you know, you'll get there. Those will find you when the time is right. Um, and then the last piece that that we've got down here is, you know, which really, why are you raising? And so asking yourself that question of, oh, do I, am I just raising because this seemed like the, the thing to do because everyone around me is, is raising VC? 
Um, or is there a particular reason that, you know, hey, I want to scale faster. I want to hire X amount of developers to build out this MVP. Um, the quote here is from Bill Gurley, who's a, a well-known venture capitalist that was early in Uber and some others uh, from Benchmark. And he talks about, you know, bootstrapping or growing your business without venture funding um, with limited resources often leads to better decision making and then therefore long term better outcomes. Um, you know, meaning kind of the opposite of the WeWork debacle, which is, hey, when you don't have all the money in the world, you've got to be really efficient and diligent with the choices that you're making. So actually, there's a lot better decision making that goes that goes in into this all. Nick, do you have anything else on on that for why raising? I know it'll bleed over to this next next slide too. Yeah, I think I just the other question right before that is why are you even starting the company? And, and what, what mm -hmm. is your what is your real purpose for the company and not getting you know lost up on that um and that's different than kind of like the company's mission statement and you kind of got to be selfish in a way and i get everyone wants to be you know all about the company and the mission but i think if, if you know at the end of the day you know it's, you're not motivated to build the company it's not gonna not gonna work out so you gotta do a little introspection um and, and figure out okay is this Am I really just trying to build a unicorn that's going to go down in history, or am I really just want to, you know, set some money aside for my family, or build build a company that is doing what I want to do, or um, just be be honest with yourself about that? Yeah, the, the venture landscape is a milestone based business, and they in order for their funds to work, they've got to bet on folks that are looking to go into this all or nothing game right of hey i need to be a multi multi billion or trillion dollar company which if that's your overall goal your incentives are aligned but like nick said if it's um, more of kind of this lifestyle business you know vc may may not be that um barring that you know just going to the question of now okay um wh why do i want to raise money we've checked that box off now how much do i do i need um, is an important question. So we've often, uh, you know, my time as, as a venture capitalist, I know Nick also investing in companies gotten, you know, these pit checks of, okay, we're raising $10 million, you know, to, um, for one specific thing, like you've got to give a little bit more intel and details as to how you came up with these numbers and why you need this um, and, and what the next milestones are that you want to achieve with that particular dollar amount. Um, Nick will have a lot more on sort of this piece of what are my fundraising options. But like we said, you know, venture capital, most of this tracking that we'll show you is really designed for angel investors and, and venture capitalists. But there's a slew of all different sorts of fundraising options available for you, right? With, um, you know, different syndicates popping up like Republic or AngelList, um, you know, grants from governments. And there, you know, Nick will, will dive a little bit into into some of these. But really, if you haven't explored some of the other alternative uh, ways of, of um, raising money, it's you know, you're doing yourself a disservice by by not understanding all the different instruments that are all that are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think being deliberate and intentional about the ones you you pursue is important. And yeah. You know, just because you get introduced to someone or someone's talking to you doesn't mean that they're really, really a fit to invest. Uh, you know, in, in my experience, if if the VCs aren't beating down your door, you're probably not going to get VC funding. You know, maybe every now and every now and then, um, you know, there's people that slide under the radar and they show up and they get get funded. But generally, uh, you know, it's I think it's like eight out of ten VC deals are funded by people that have already. You've done a VC deal already, kind of been in the in the network. So you, 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 yeah, I think you should really think hard, long and hard about alternative options. Uh, and and, and it, I think there's three three main ones that I look at today. Um, and crowdfunding certainly taking off. There's new SEC regulations that came out that, that allow you to raise more more capital. Uh, through crowdfunding, uh, it used to be one million per year. Now it's five million per year. There's a handful of other favorable policies that came out through that. Uh, and the the crowdfunding platforms have real investor audiences, and you know there's there's investors there that you can connect with that are writing checks. And I've heard you know, of, you know four or five years ago, 
almost all these same platforms exist, but you really heard of companies raising money on them, uh, or really even heard of companies that were interested in them. And it to seems totally different now. Uh, you know, I've talked to a dozen or so companies this year that have you know, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on crowdfunding. Uh, you know, crowdfunding is really good for like physical products, consumer packaged goods, things that you can touch and feel. So people, you know, things with a consumer audience. If you have a bunch of people sitting there waiting to you know, like your stuff on social media and buy your pr products and you know, you're, you're a big influencer, like crowdfunding can be an awesome, awesome solution because it gives all those non-accredited investors uh, an opportunity to invest a little, a little bit, and that can can be a big difference. You know, the, the, the other alternative financing method I'm really hot on is revenue-based financing, which is when investors get paid back a percentage of their investment through a royalty. So it's a percentage of revenues, either on a quarterly or annual basis, and, and then there's a return cap tied to that agreement. So they usually get two x their money back, or 1.5 x their money back, or you know, whatever it could be. And this is really good for cash flow businesses that, you know, are easy to launch and get revenue, maybe are a little, little harder to justify as high scale, high growth companies. So, you know, again, consumer packaged goods companies, uh, you know, agency type businesses, services, tech enabled services, professional services, um, you know, and, and, and a handful of everything, like pretty much, Pretty much everything where you can get initial initial revenue and you have positive margins, it can it can help. Um, and, and and there's also you know a thing with like the angels where it's it's becoming very hard for your everyday angel to participate in traditional venture financings where the companies are raising, you know, a couple million dollar seed and then a ten million dollar A and then a hundred fifty million dollar Series B and like that that these big funds that come in at the end. They, it, it, it's becoming harder and harder for angels to participate um, and, and, and also just to get their money back. And, and so I think for a lot of you know, everyday you know, angels and investors who maybe have made a lot of money in real estate, oil and gas, the stock market, revenue-based financing is attractive because you're positioning the startup investment as a, as a cash flow investment instead of a, a long-term equity investment, right? And, um, yeah, and then the last one is just really the angel only equity. And, and so uh, almost every company that's got, kind of going out, raise in on a convertible note or a safe from angels is uh, intending to go raise from VCs as well. And, you know, JD got into a little bit, like there's these dynamics that like once you take money from a fund that has its own investors that are expecting very high rates of return, it, it puts this impetus on growth that you just don't get with angels. And you know, 10 years ago, you'd see fully funded companies just with angel investors that would get, you know, two to, you know, 10 million bucks. They'd grow to 10 to 30 million bucks in revenue. They'd sell for two or three X revenue to a you know, private equity firm. And, you know, that's, that was a home run. And, you know, with the way venture deals are getting set up today, where you've got, you know, these $10 million pre-money valuations on the first round, like you can't, you can't make that exit line up for 50 million bucks and still expect uh, you know, to, to get that same return for those early investors, right? Because the early valuation is just so high. And so everyone like feels like they're optimizing for the round of like, oh, let's get super high valuation. Like let's not like, get diluted, but really you want to optimize for the life cycle, which could mean taking a lower valuation today and then, and then uh, you know, giving yourself more room to step it up in, in subsequent rounds. Um, and, and yeah, and so, so working with angels to you know, fully fund your venture and, and, and being deliberate about that is another another opportunity. So so yeah, there's a lot, and, and you kind of got to figure out what's going to work for you. And, and again, it goes back to those original questions of, hey, like, what's my purpose with this company, and what capital do I need to, to finance it? Yeah, the uh, you know the number one, if you can fund your whole business without giving any of it up and just having customers re prepay you or through customer revenue. Um, you know, that's a huge green green check mark. I see loads of VCs starting their own companies, not wanting to take anyone else's money because they understand the dynamics here or at, until they become so mature that um, they can demand a higher price and, and you sort of know what that looks like down the road. Um, so yeah, we'll keep an eye on the clock here. You know, we'll find we're going to break into really this um, 
targeting my investor strategy now. This this slide and then the next one really showing you some um, some tactical solutions. But you know, kind of now we've we've checked this part out. You know, okay, JD and Nick, thanks for setting me up. After all of you said, I still want to raise money. I believe I'm a venture deal. Um, I want to go through this process. How, how do I set up? You know, managing the investors I want to go target. So. Um, the first step that we we recommend you do is really think about um, profiling your investors. So segmenting them right by the check sizes, their geographies, all the different things that you'd probably already find online and you'd already be measuring. Um, here are some of the other things that maybe don't jump out as much that are still very important. Because understand, you're going to shift your pitch a little bit for each investor depending on what are they looking what are they looking for and how are you going to align and, and pull them in to be most interested in, in your venture. And so you know the first first two line up with one another, which is are they value seeking investors, which means they're typically going to be much more price sensitive to the terms. Um, or are they looking for total unicorns, in which case they're typically price insensitive? So Gray Croft would be an example um, out in LA around value-based investing, which is, okay, we want to see you check off all these boxes of you know, de-risking the business over time. So your growth rates look really good. You de-risk the tech. You have a certain amount of users. You're growing at this steady rate. Um, versus like a gray lock that, you know, invests in the, the Facebooks and LinkedIn's of the world that are kind of these hyper growth companies before they've even made a dollar. Um, they're really price insensitive. You know, Clubhouse is the one that gets all the traction these days that, that look like that. And really, that's more aligned with a typical venture model, which is this winner take all mentality or winner take most, um, which, again, is, you know, how do you get uh in an investment return of 100x, 500x, you know, Coinbase recently, 2200x for, for the earliest investors. Um, so, you know, think about that more so, whereas value is maybe I'm looking at taking a part of the market that already exists, which is um, interesting of itself, right? There's, we, if even if we, you know, if we get 1% of this market will be a successful business. Um, that's easier to conceptualize for investors, right? There's already a market, it's already happening. You've got a value prop of taking market share versus we wanna you know, create an entirely new industry. This is like an Airbnb or an Uber or a lot of the early blockchain companies that doesn't exist yet. And so, you know, it's, there's an asymmetrical risk reward. If it does work, everybody is going to make a whole lot of, of money and massive, massive returns. And but there's a high, high probability that it doesn't. Um, the last couple here, you know, some of these folks are, are in firms are becoming a lot more mission driven. There's different uh, angles, whether it's climate change or a focus on DEI. It doesn't mean that they're charity or nonprofits. It means that they have a dual focus of both, you know, investing and in, in sort of impacting the world. And so even if you don't fit in, you're not a sustainability company and you, you see it and investors really interested in that space, there might be sustainability efforts that you do within your company that's going to align with, with the investors. Remember that there are people too. Um, and then some of the non-negotiables, do they have founder criteria, right? Everyone has on their site, we're investing in the next generation, most amazing founders in the world that, you know, want to achieve, uh, you know, dominate world hunger and solve cancer and do impossible things. Okay, that's great. Um, what, what I'm talking about here is, you know, there's a great investor here in, um, based out of Texas, Bill Wood, that, you know, one of his tests in order to actually invest in an early stage company is you've had to, con you know, overcome some near near death or near company death experience, some hardship, right? And so what that means is, have you um, had a founder divorce early on and gotten back back up and rolling? Um, have you run out of money for you know 15 days and couldn't make payroll, but you pulled it together and got some other customers in the door and, and have, have continued on with, with, your, with your business? Understand that these things are inevitable. They will happen really tough times. And so if you can prove through, that you've gotten through some things, that's often a, a, a huge uh, green check mark as well. All right. So I know that's a whole lot of data. Um, 
where we have made it to the tactical portion where um, I'll kind of peruse through this with pipeline and CRM, and then we'll flip it over to the, the most interesting side of things that take in Q&A in just a couple of minutes here. Um, so I'm going to jump in for, for time basis, but Nick, feel free to, to yell at me if, if you've got things to add as we, we walk through these. Um, Many folks have different ways of, of managing pipeline. The, the top chart here is going to be answering the question of how, where do I even start? How do I get in the door with the right investors? How do I track them um, throughout the meetings in terms of getting them in the funnel? The second chart here, um, credit to, to the Techstars Toolkit, who has a, a lot of really amazing content and, and um, tools for you to use in your fundraising process, is much more around, okay, how do I actually manage um, me asking for the check to the money being wired to my account. Because understand, nobody has invested in your startup until you see the actual number and dollars of cash in your bank account, right? We all probably have seen way too many stories of every step in the process on that chart, um, you know, it, the, the, the deal is falling apart. So this gives you a framework for, for managing that. Um, so, you know, the first one, we'll just run through the top chart, which is going to be most important in this, or at least kind of to, to understand. Um, you know, you could put anything in here, right? And so it might be the check sizes and other information about the particular investors you're targeting. But, you know, manage a level, you know, and, and you know, it could be a CRM system. This is a, a, a very basic point of where do I even start? You know, the venture firm, but, you know, who it is you're talking with. Seniority is an important one to, to hit on because, Many times at venture firms, you'll be meeting an analyst or an associate. Um, and similar to if you're going to be selling into a big company and you've got sort of a mid-manager or junior person that really loves your product, wants to see us buy it, they may not be the decision maker. Um, and so at a venture firm, you know, a specific partner or person typically does the deal. And so that's who you're going to want to target. And so pay, pay attention there. Um, you know, how hot or warm warm the target might be, or, or maybe you don't have any into them yet. And so they're, you're just setting it in as a target, really just jotting down why and, you know, what's the, what's their thesis? Why does it fit with your business as a marketplace business? You know, do they invest in marketplaces and they have portfolio company A, B, and C that all look like similar um, in different spaces to what you're tackling? Um, you know, warm introductions. Um, this is the last big point we'll, we'll make on this before flipping it over to y'all. And that is, you know, still like Nick mentioned, something like, you know, eight out of 10 deals are still done sort of within the network of people that have already broken into this. And so while you see lots of investors advertising on Twitter and other places, our doors are open. Anybody can send an email. We read everything. Um, you know, we're, we try to do this without without bias. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it, you know, it is a relationship and trust business. And so oftentimes a majority of the companies, folks have already known, maybe for people for decades past. And so it's important to, to come in through the right medium. And whether you've known the investor for a long time or you're just going to start to begin to build that relationship. And then the check may, may come in three, six, 12, 18 months later down that road, um, you know, and then a couple of things on, on tracking the meetings. So with yeah. that, Nick, I'll let you kind of close us out here and then, um, and then we can jump to, to Q and A. Yeah. I think just two points to add here. I, I wouldn't rule out cold outreach. I think you definitely want warm, warm intros. I, I would still, I just start, with cold outreach, there's tools you can use to automate that. I usually, you know, will phrase it like, hey, I'm working on a warm intro, but really want to connect with you with, you know, thought I'd reach out here or something. Um, the other thing is getting information on investors is, is pretty tough. Uh, always take good notes. And, you know, one thing not shown on that the, the, the CRM sheet that's like probably just a level deeper is just actually tying notes on all your calls, especially once you start talking to a lot of investors that can be very overwhelming, but you know, you're in these calls, you want to solicit information from the investors as much as they're soliciting information for you or you're sharing information with them. Um, 
so yeah, and just kind of keep keep good notes and, and yeah, you can you can build that into your sales CRM. If you have a HubSpot or you know Salesforce, you can create a new pipeline uh, and, and run all of your your investor deals through that pipeline, and then also kind of create a different persona in your contacts that you know, is for investors. So you can kind of segment segment them all out. And I, I don't know if I do that if you aren't already using a CRM. Um, a, a, a spreadsheet can work, but if you are, it's, yeah, it can be easy if, if you're you know, used to that to that system. And you know, remember these thoughts and tools are um, you know thought process to help you um, really design an, an effective way of an efficient way of fundraising as quickly as possible and as efficient as efficiently as possible, so you can get back to running your business. And so, you know, think of this as an investment up front in order to get more time back in, into your day. Um, great. So with that, Joshua, happy to invite you back up to the stage to, to help moderate or we can, um, we can dive into some of these questions we see on the chat. I imagine that's what we'll, we'll be using here um, to close us out the last, last 15 or, or 20 minutes or so. Um. Hey guys, yeah, that was amazing. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, go ahead and address anything that was in the chat that you didn't get to. And then um, uh, for everybody else, if you want to be able to come off a of mic and if you want to ask your question uh, for JD and Nick uh, uh, in person, um, just go ahead and uh, do, the, do the hand raise function. If you um, click the hamburger dots in your uh, uh, on the attendees tab on the right hand side there. If you click those hamburger dots, you'll be able to raise your hand. Um, and then I can uh, give you those presenter privileges and you can uh, turn your mic on, turn your camera on, and you can uh, ask them the question, but, um, or you can just go ahead and type them into the, into the uh, chat box and JD and Nick will, will take it from there. Also, if you um, need help with something from the community, if you want to give a community shout out, if you're looking for a CTO, if you're looking for um, uh, someone to help you with marketing, or if you are a CTO and you want to help out a company, or if you uh, are a um, uh, running a marketing agency or a freelance market or something like that, um, go ahead and feel free to um, plug what you're working on um, uh, if you come off mic. So um, yeah, if you uh, if anybody wants to come off mic and turn the camera on, go ahead and raise your hand. Otherwise, put your questions in the chat and JD and Nick will take care of them there. Awesome. We are all about the, uh, the the community, the community support and feel. So also, you know, feel free to use us as as resources if we can. This is something that we've been doing for a long time and supporting entrepreneurs and um, and we're happy to do so. OK, so um, first one around. Can you talk about how much do you give up um, in ownership of your company and in, in each stage um, or like, how, you know, how much equity in general do, do, do you give up? Um, so yeah, my, my first inkling on this, um, so mostly institutional investors that are gonna you know, write a real check and maybe take a board seat, this would be for your first seed stage round. Um, think of it in the, in the um, neighborhood of 20%, 20 to 25% sometimes is, um, is kind of the, enough that they need a target to be able to get diluted down and make their own returns for seed stage funds. There are no hard and fast rules about this. Um, earlier, when we talk about angel rounds and even you know sort of early VC deals, what we more see that's common is raising what on, on some instruments Nick noted before, convertible notes and safes, which is what YC um, invented. Which is you know for for those of you that haven't heard of, of these, we, we can post a link afterwards. But it's essentially giving you. Um, saying, hey, I don't know exactly how to value this business yet. It's very early. So please, you can go ahead and invest invest money in my business. And we'll just kick that off down the road until we get real institutional investors that price our company. And we're going to give you a little bit of a discount for doing so. So for every $5, you know, they, they invested, you're really going to get it for $4, um, you know, if it's a year later or something. That's the basic um, sort of thought process of that. Nick, you want to take this next one on um, on revenue based financing? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'll take the next two. Um, yeah, I think so. Stephen's talking about we pitched a few revenue based financing uh, deals. They uh, seem like they're taking cash off the table when cash was needed so desperately, and asked for my thoughts on it. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's you know, revenue-based financing is not going to be the the blitzkrieg, uh, blitz scale, uh, you know, approach, right? Of of you know, a situation where really a company should ever be desperate for cash and kind of going back to that that piece. And and it's uh, yeah, it's not a all all systems you know to to the moon. It's more of just a managed uh, managed growth, right? And and so I think it needs to just model out and it's hey we're trying to go from point a to point b and you know you, you have the cash flow to, to to pay for it right in some situations that makes sense in some situations uh it it, it doesn't and, and so yeah i think at the end of the day you just you know we, we can't sit here and just put everything into growth and keep growing companies i think you gotta you know manage them to sustainability and profitability and you know there's you know, big funds don't really need to do that. But a lot of like, for those of you who aren't getting funding from big funds, I would just look to more moderate ways to grow your, your company and, and articulate that to the right, right investor with the right structure. And yeah, so, so again, for like cash flow businesses where, hey, we're selling, you know, products, we got a 50 to 75% margin, uh, you know, and, and the revenue based financing should, should, should work for it fine um yeah. and uh yeah i think the, the kevin o'leary on shark tank always gets flack <laughs> for uh revenue-based deals as like all the other sharks take massive pieces of ownership uh, out of the company and throw them into their their pond of like hundreds of other companies and probably never never talk to them again and, and so it's uh yeah i i think if it, it yeah i think some people but again like vc investors are kind of really good at marketing themselves and and by giving high valuations and giving a lot of money and like not asking for any of it back until you're super big and like yeah it sounds really really nice um but i think when you play out the odds right and one thing we didn't mention is that you know out of all the companies that get funded by ventures ten thousand at any one time there's 0 0.01 that actually achieve this unicorn valuation right 0 0.02 that achieve a hundred mil million dollar valuation most other companies like even if you grow it to 50 million in revenue you can be totally locked in and not get the not get the cash right yeah. and not get an exit opportunity so um yeah i think for that's why why you do it um you, you want to take next one on the yeah i was just gonna say we've got a lot of really great questions coming to the chat here so props to you all for for asking these kinds of things we'll, we'll try to get to as many as they can so next one up here can we delineate the teaser versus a face-to-face -face versus you know leave behind the slide deck content um you know maybe when when meeting investors i'm going to quickly um just share this back another slide you know we don't have time to conquer the world but worth pulling this one up um so you know your goal when you meet an investor is is to get face to face or get in the room with them. Uh, if it's a Zoom, that's great. If it's a phone call, that works. Um, but you know, we see a lot of these kind of conversations that say, "Yeah, send, you know, send me a deck." And so here's a, a a screen that we recommend of here's some just sort of basic investor material prep that you should have ready for different stages in this process. And that bottom left, you know, it's important to distinguish the difference between an emailable deck which is be read and will probably be forwarded out all around everywhere you can not even think of um, because that happens in this world, whether you know you tell them it's confidential or not, um, versus a presentation deck, which might go into some more um, sensitive information around a financial model and your cap table, which is only something that you might wanna share in person. So, you know, I'd say the, the main goal is for the introduction to draw enough interest that you get the meeting that you can story tell. At this early of a stage, it's about building trust, it's the team, it's about people falling in love with you as much as the idea and wanting to bet on you as a team to go tackle whatever this mission is. Chances are that that might change around one or a couple of times pivoting through, um, but hopefully that gives you some, some uh, context there. Um, the next one we've got is in addition to uh, cash and advice to investors, also try to facilitate intros to clients. If yes, what's the best approach to connect with them um, as users for free? So, uh, you know, the quick quick on this is like, yeah, when you're vetting out an investor because they're only giving you cash, go see, you know, what other value they can give you. Um, what we mostly see is they're very helpful in the hiring process. So they built up a, 
a large network of execs that they might be able to introduce you to a VP of sales or a CTO, you know, later down the road. Um, doing, you know, customer development and other partnership development. Some of the bigger firms have staff to do this. Keep in mind that they're still very small teams. So the majority are not gonna be extremely impactful in this. Um, but talk, talk to some of the, the, the portfolio companies some of these in, investors have, have put out there. They've got a very competitive business. So, um, so they are incentivized to do more and more, you know, to help out their companies. Um, I'll ask this one for you, Nick. Uh, how would you suggest we go about building a pipeline? I and current investors do not have contacts in, in the venture world. So um, maybe relying on cold calls. Yeah, um, you know, I, cold calls do, do do happen. They do work. Um, yeah, I think it's some. Everyone starts from a different place with this, right? And some people are very well connected and are very you know, good at building trust quickly. Some people aren't connected but can build relationships quickly. Some people it's just tough all around, right? And so, um, you know, I think it. Again, first point of con, first, first, first piece of advice is put yourself in a situation where you're not going to run out of money, and, and give yourself time to build these relationships. Like if you're going into this and you're thinking you're going to raise in three to six months, and you don't really even have investor relationships yet, um, like it's just it's just probably going to take longer than that, right? And and so I think understand that uh, use. Uh, do personal research and outreach, right? And like, go look up these investors, look look beyond the surface, look at YouTube videos, white papers they've written, figure out what really makes them tick and then talk about that stuff in your outreach. So, you know, if there's a way, like a lot of these investors are so deep into some of these problems. Like if you're working on it, they're at least gonna give you the time of day, like at least need to hear you out. So it's like, you know, positioning yourself inside that by doing really good, really good research, um, you know, and then you might be able to hack the world a little bit and, and maybe through your advisory board, um, you know, add some people that have good connections, uh, you know, even through your, your executive team, add, add good connections. Uh, you could work with you know, an accelerator or a, a group like, like mine to you know, help, help with that. Um, but I, I would, I'd always say that those are not not the full answer. Um, and yeah, I think at the end of the day, you're gonna have to talk to a lot of people, build a lot of relationships. And frankly, it's, it's really hard right now without events, right? That's the other thing, like, yeah, as you can start going to events, that's a whole nother, whole nother world. And you know, can, can be really easy to meet investors if you can just get into the rooms and get the intros. Uh, but that hasn't even really been an option. I still haven't heard, like, I know there's a, a few things going on, but you know, especially, you know, I think in New York, not, not as much of an option right now. Yeah, there's, you know, just one other quick point on that is, um, you know, this is why our, our program in particular is designed for, for Oracle is, hey, I don't have this big group of customers to go sell to. Where do I even start with that? And so similarly, you know, what you're part of right now in the startup grind network, whether it's an accelerator, where there are venture studios, there are different tools and communities that, are a great starting point where you can sort of, you know, dip your toes and um, get your feet wet. And, you know, using customers or a partner um, that wants to see you succeed is also a really great way of, you know, just exploring, hey, is there anyone that you think would be interesting for me to meet? JD, I'm a B2B SaaS company and construction that does X, Y, Z. Um, you'll find that, um, you know, in a lot of these places, it's a, it's a fairly supportive, there's a lot of supporters on the sideline, whether it be bankers, lawyers, all service providers, corporates um, that, that want to help in, in, in a myriad of, of different ways. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, you might, I just add one quick thing on like associates. Um, you'll probably, if you, if you don't already have a good network, you probably have to deal with associates. A lot of these funds have armies of them they're just well, are paid to talk to you all day every day uh you gotta really really try to manage those relationships and and you know one use your gut on whether this person really thinks there's a chance you're going to get funded um or or they're just trying to learn from you and then if they are if you do think there's a chance there's gonna you know they're gonna do a deal 
keep keep your eyes on keep a pulse on where you're at with that deal and where you're at in the process and just kind of make sure it's it's getting moving forward and try to move up the the chain right and so um but on the other hand the associates are generally pretty easy to connect with uh, and so yeah with linkedin i think twitter is very easy to connect with people you know clubhouse uh, I'm on Clubhouse a lot. Uh, you know, there's Clubhouse tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, there's some VCs we have from Techstars coming. Um, so yeah, I think that that stuff can all can all work for sure. All right, I know we're coming up, so maybe we'll get through one, maybe both of these, and and let Joshua you come on up and and close us out here. Uh, so thanks for for your questions and and hanging out with us this afternoon. Um, so, uh, Ryan, what are your thoughts of just incubators in general? So corporate backed ones, there's a lot of different types of corporate programs, Oracle being one of the many. Um, do you think it's worth giving up, you know, 10% plus equity in, in return for their mentorship and network? Um, so this is a question I think is personal, personal to you and your business. Um, you know, at Oracle, we don't take any equity. There's a lot of equity free sort of corporate um, accelerator type programs or startup growth programs out there now. Um, you know, for context, I think typically we see them in, in the percentages of maybe up to 6%. And that usually comes with some, some cash as well being invested in your business. Um, but this is a, you know, a question, if you really think that there's a huge amount of value to unlock there, best way to decide that is to go talk to the companies that have gone through these programs. It could be interesting. My gut reaction is, 10% seems pretty high if there's not a, a large investment that's coming along with that. That's going to make the dynamics a, a pretty challenging down the road. Um, but again, you know, this is something that you'd need to evaluate and, and just go ahead and talk to talk to those folks that have been through a particular program you're looking at. Nick, you want to just take that that last one and we'll end 30 seconds over. Yeah. Focusing on fundraise and early stage can mean sales growth slowing down. So should we raise after the hockey stick and sales happens, which could be a tricky situation as many companies are raising to go to market after initial success. What is your take on VCs investing on growth at the seed stage? So I, I think at, my first thought on this is that sometimes the best way to increase your odds of raising money isn't to try to go raise money it's to work on your business right and 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 it's kind of amazing no one really thinks of that but you know yeah so you can go i think if there's ever any doubt on whether it's too early to raise money it's probably too early to raise money and you should just go figure out crappy hustling ways to do it and frankly yeah i think the companies that really get funded like like they attract the investors to them, you know? And, and so and, and you, whether it be by building something that you put out there that people, catches people's attention or getting press, like, you know, and like, yeah, you ultimately are gonna reach out too. Um, but yeah, I think when in doubt, uh, yeah, try to just go get those sales. Like really, sometimes you gotta swallow your pride on your product and you, you gotta start as just something completely different. And it's not about having someone buy your product, it's, it's getting your intended customer to just buy anything from you, right? And like creating that customer relationship is, is super powerful. And, and it can just be in, you know, some probably just services, right? Or something very basic. And I think that's a great way to start and um, can get you there. And as far as VCs investing um, on growth at the seed stage, I mean, it's kind of like the, the terms are a little jump, uh, you know, semantics that mean everything here. But in a lot of ways, like, I don't know, like, I don't think VCs are investing in growth at, at the seed stage and VCs are investing in experiments at the seed stage. And, and it's really, you know, the, the growth stage comes after the seed stage. That's really where, where um, you know, you start to see investors that are thinking, okay, I'm going to put this much money in, they're going to get to this much revenue because they've found product market fit, right? And so the seed stage is a, a series of of financings could be your angel round, your pre-seed round, your seed round, post-seed, whatever that, that ends up helping you discover product market fit. And, and then after that is really when you're gonna start getting growth finance exactly right. But you know, kind of the terms get used in a lot of different ways. So, that, so that's just my take on it. Cool. 
Um, thank, thanks so much, y'all. Thank you, Joshua. I'll let you, let you close this out. I'm, I'm just putting my email there in, in the uh, chat channel. I know Nick will do the same. If, if we can be helpful, you know, feel free to, to reach out to us, email or, or LinkedIn. But um, keep on building and um, enjoyed spending time with you this afternoon. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, this was a this was an awesome session. Um, thank you so much, uh, y'all. This was um, super interesting to to hear it a couple of times. I did listen in on the Boston chat earlier today, so um, I know I'm, I'm uh, like you, JD. I'm with a, a fairly large organization, but every every now and then I hear a super inspiring uh, speaker that makes me want to um, uh, leave that uh, cushy <laughs> paycheck life and go start something new and scrappy. Um, where, where are y'all coming from in Texas, Nick? I think you said you're in Austin. I'm in a small, small village called Valente, right outside of Austin here. So I'm nice. Pretty, pretty much in Austin. Yeah, likewise, what we refer to as Oracle in Oracle as HQ1 now. Um, so in, in the headquarters in Austin. Yep. Nice. I'm, uh, I'm from Denton myself, up north of Dallas. Nice. My, uh -huh. my wife is in North Texas. Yeah, that is a North Texas diploma right there behind me. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Brooklyn now, so uh, helping out this uh, this New York startup scene um, and really enjoying yeah. all the amazing people that we have here um, who uh, were really appreciative for tuning in. Thank you, Nick and JD, for this incredible conversation. Uh, and a special thank you to our audience for joining in. Uh, we're... Um, we're super excited that this conversation has also been recorded and it'll be available in the next few days if anybody wants to share this with their communities. Uh, and I'm sure, like you said, you all know it's Earth Day today, but we want to keep the conversation going about how we can protect our planet beyond just April 22nd every year. Um, and so next week, we'll be back with another great story from an entrepreneur who has created the first AI-powered clean energy marketplace for urban clean energy solutions. Kevin Brookmeyer is the co-founder and CEO of Station A, and his company, his growing company is tackling the intersection of emerging technologies and sustainability head on. And you can find out more in RSVP uh, by going to startupgrind.com and searching for the New York chapter. You can also uh, check out all of our previous interviews. Um, and, uh, and I'll put the link in the event chat here in just a second. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. And uh, hopefully we will see you next week. Uh, JD and Nick, you all have a great afternoon and good luck to you. Hey, I'll re reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, y'all.